Hello, everyone. So we're going to be starting in probably like three to five minutes once we let everyone trickle in. So how about in the meantime, can everybody um, put in the chat where they're from and how they're doing? Southern California. Rhode Island. Wow, thank you everyone for coming from all over the country and joining us today on this Sunday afternoon. I can probably go until like 203, 203 or 204. Um, actually, so Lydia, would it be okay if before we start the presentation, um, we do like a group picture if some people are um, comfortable turning their cameras on? Absolutely love it. I'd love nothing more. <laughs> Yay. Okay. So you would have to click stop share first. Ah, uh, okay. And I think when you click um, share screen again later and share computer sound will be defaulted. So you'll be okay. Uh, okay, I'll give it my best. So stop sharing my whole screen. Is that right? Yes. Hi, everyone joining just now. So we're going to start in a couple of minutes. We're just going to um, start off the call with the group picture if you're comfortable turning your camera on just for a second. But if not, that's totally OK. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Okay, I think that's good. Wait, is it, is it command shift three or four? I'm sorry, I always forget. Four, okay. Is that for the whole, isn't that when you select it or is that for the whole screen? Three is for the whole screen. Okay, thanks Adam. Okay, ready? Everyone smile, give a big smile, all right? One, two, three. And then I'm gonna to get to the next page. One sec. Okay, he's smiling. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, if you want to, you can turn your camera off and we can start the presentation. How does that look? Looks perfect. Okay, so 
Um, first, I want to say welcome, everybody. So this is MetroHacks Empower. Um, this is our very first keynote speaker event, which we're very excited about. And if you don't know what Empower is, basically, we're a long term coding competition for young girls interested in STEM, where they address a problem in their community. So we have mentors matched to them, workshop events, and then things like this, like keynote events. And the keynotes are open to anybody, even if you're not a participant in the competition. But if you are interested in participating long term, then definitely email info at metrohacks.org. Um, I think Anna will put in the link to our website in the chat now if you're interested in learning more. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Lydia. Uh, well, hi, everybody, and thank you so much. So awesome to be here. Um, I'm thrilled to be a part of this community, and it's so awesome to see how far you've virtually traveled uh, to join us today as part of um, this Metro Hacks event. It's one of the sort of blessings and surprises of COVID that we can use these virtual platforms to connect to connect even further and farther. Uh, my name is Lydia Smyers and my Twitter handle is at Lydia Smyers. I am um, an employee of Microsoft and a long time STEM advocate and a bit of a fem STEM myself. So we'll, go, we'll get a little bit into that. Um, but to get us all started, I thought I would start with some quick um, info in the chat. I'd love for people to share um, an emoji, if you can, go with me on this, but an emoji of like how you're feeling today or your outlook for the day, um, any emoji that sort of sums up your opinion, uh, um, like how things are going for you today or how you describe um, today. Potentially it's full of um, optimism and excitement about this event and the keynote overall. Uh, maybe there's something, you know, at, in home, um, that is top of mind for you. We just love to see and share. And interestingly, <laughs> I'm not a very familiar Zoom user, but my chat actually, it looks like maybe went away, guys. Um, I think on. if you click like the, the more option, there should be. That's right. Up -down. Thank you, there it is. Okay, I see a camel. I see some smiley faces. I love it. Some celebratory um, emojis, that's really good. Um, very good. Some surprised emojis, probably surprising to get a meeting started with an emoji paste, right? Like, that's different. <laughs> um, and thank you so much to see lots of like excitement and energy and happiness for the day. Um, Great to see everyone kind of participating. Thank you. We will probably have some time to um, share some observations back and forth in the chat. Um, I'll let you know that at Microsoft, we have a lot of meetings these days. We happen to be using um, the Microsoft Teams platform. But one of the things that we do is we get our meeting started. Sometimes it's with an emoji. Sometimes it's with a photo, like share a photo from, you know, your, your weekend. Uh, sometimes it's just two words, two words to check in and, and two words to describe how you're doing. And that way you get to kind of connect with people um, virtually in a different way. Again, it's sort of one of these new ways of connection that we've been able to unpack and and learn um, in this new pandemic in which we all face. So super excited to spend a little bit of the rest of um, the balance of this hour with you today. So to get started, I thought I'd share just a, a little bit about me um, because I've had a interesting journey. If you think about someone with just a sort of a STEM career, I always found myself in um, grade school and in high school having a sort of a more natural affinity to science and math. And while I was never the only woman in my math and science classes, I was definitely outnumbered. And so finding friends and connections sometimes was mm, a little hard, but I also found that the bonds that I forged with those women in my class 
um, just were some of the best and some of my have become some of my lifelong friends. So after my math and science interests in high school, I went on to college in Connecticut and I noticed that there's some folks here um, on today's event from Connecticut. I went to Trinity College and I actually picked Trinity because I really liked a lot of things about it. I liked the, um, how I liked how it was in an urban setting, um, which for me, I grew up in New Hampshire. So like miles away from anywhere. In fact, it took me over a half an hour to get to a movie theater, a mall, and even like a swimming pool. <laughs> it's pretty far away from a lot of stuff. And so I was super excited to be in a more urban environment. And um, Trinity really, for me, stood to, um, st came up at the top of the list because it's this smaller school that also had a really good science and math program. So uh, for a liberal arts college, it had a really quite a strong um, STEM program. So I ultimately did pursue a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry, and I, I loved it. I, I enjoyed the coursework, and I'll tell a bit more of the story later. But I, I kind of felt as though I didn't want to pursue my master's in chemistry. I felt like I was ready to try the job market, and maybe that would be something I'd go back to. So my love of the technology and problem solving actually landed me a job with Bristol-Myers Squibb. And while I wasn't in um, the research lab, I actually was out in the field. I was um, in sales and account management. Uh, take, and I actually sold a whole product of um, women's health pharmaceuticals. And so it was really an incredible experience for me to be coming right out of college and at you know barely 21 years old and talking to doctors and uh, nurse practitioners and physician's assistants who were very, very knowledgeable in their field, but I was bringing them kind of new science. I was citing research papers. I was always leading with um, facts and data and, and um, all of what Bristol-Myers Squibb was bringing to bear. And it was also personally really satisfying because um, I was selling uh, products that were aligned to women's health. I was many, a, a whole sort of an array of products. So I would go visit women health, women's health clinics, um, even in some rural areas at the time I was living, um, in fact, in West Virginia. And it was incredible to see what a difference access to women's health could bring. And so I just really loved um, how I was able to bridge my STEM career into not just a technical sales role, but a technical sales role that ultimately, um, had purpose, right? And I was able to apply some passions that I had. So that was a pretty exciting shift. Um, after three years, I had sort of saved up a lot of my money from the sales role and I wanted to pursue, I, I knew graduating from college, I, I knew I wanted to go back and get a grad degree. Um, but for me at that time, the right choice was pursuing my master's in business administration. I was able to actually get a certificate in health uh, services management as well at Duke. And it was a great place to spend two years with um, like nice weather, 11 months out of the year, uh, which was very different from New Hampshire and <laughs> Connecticut where I was more familiar. And those two years at Duke <clears throat> were great. It was great to take um, what I saw is my technical background really allowed me to um, apply my interest in a very broad range at business school. I had technical expertise that allowed um, finance classes to come a lot more easily, statistics classes to come a lot more easily. But then some of these leadership courses and management courses that you take at business school provided a great rounding out for me and for my career and what was of interest to me at that time. <clears throat> so for my business school um, degree, after graduating from that with that, I went on to pursue consulting. Um, management consulting, I felt, was sort of a good way for me to take a business degree and kind of extend it for a couple of years, uh, be able to work on different projects. And this love that I had formed for problem solving that I think started in college with my chemistry degree, continued on with helping solve technical selling um, with physicians at Bristol-Myers Squibb and then ultimately into Duke, really continued at Ernst & Young. And what really motivated me was to 
figure out how to assess hard problems and ultimately uh, come up with project plans that allowed me to solve them and with teams. So that was an incredible experience. But at that time, um, right after my third year at Ernst & Young, it was around the year 2000. And um, many, I'm sure many of you were, were not yet born. Um, but at that time, uh, there was a, what we call the dot bomb. And there was a big um, sort of swell of interest in small internet startups. And I joined an internet startup that was uh, based actually in Cambridge, Massachusetts and had some affiliation with um, MIT. And that was a software coding platform that was going to be open source and started by a founder had affiliations with MIT. And it, it was a great couple of years, but ultimately like many um, sort of startups around the year 2000, we were not successful. <laughs> and we ended up getting purchased by Red Hat, uh, and which, which was also an open source company. So there's a lot of um, intelligence as to why Red Hat bought this startup that I was working with as we sort of, what I would say, wound down. Um, so Red Hat, I had a great opportunity to apply my business school experience and my management experience, thriving in a world that was very technical because it was the my first real entrance into sort of packaged software but the prior work at that dot-com startup um, was a little bit more just like of a coding environment um, whereas at, in red hat really the team was gold to package the software which was the linux operating system um, which is an open source system and figure out how to monetize it and bring it to commercial readiness which ultimately the company did has done very well doing that after a couple of years at red hat i saw an opportunity to transition to oracle um, at Ever since Duke, I've been based in Boston. Even though Oracle is a West Coast company, they have um, a big East Coast presence. And here in Burlington, Massachusetts, if you actually drive by it on Route 128, for those of you that are in the Massachusetts area, um, you can see sort of some of the signs on the big buildings. I think there's three now. And I was there for about 10 years. Um, tried a lot of different jobs. And it was great to go to try both I led some programs for our partners. I ran some marketing efforts. I ran some operation efforts. And every single step of my career at, at Oracle always tapped into my love for just numbers <laughs> and, and what I would just call STEM, ultimately. I was never coding. I was never coding at Oracle. I was never actually coding at Red Hat. At Ernst & Young, I, I touched some software. Um, but nevertheless, my STEM degree really helped kind of provide a strong foundation for my success at Oracle. And then my last uh, transition from a career standpoint was onto Microsoft. And I'd spent 10 great years at Oracle. But I saw an opportunity at Microsoft to do what I think, I kind of think about way back at Bristol Myers Squibb, where I was bringing my love of uh, technology and my love of STEM into a role that actually I believe helped was very purpose driven and was aligned with my passions. And so at Microsoft, I work as a part of the education team. So our work is to help school districts and universities across the entire country. Um, harness the power of Microsoft's technologies, which beyond just the suite of Office, but into Teams, all of our collaboration software, Planner, To-Do, all of that, plus also our biz apps and our Azure Cloud capabilities, and really help these technologies empower, empower students and teachers to achieve more. And that's truly the mission of Microsoft. So it's been an incredible journey. I've been at Microsoft now for seven years. I lead a team of, of about 100 people. And um, you know, with all of our job is to help make school districts um, and universities successful, to help them really figure out how to um, achieve more, improve teaching and learning, improve the student experience, improve student outcomes by harnessing the power of technology. 
that's a little bit about my career. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, if, and I'd be happy to kind of connect with any of you at any point to, to really reach out. Um, so moving on, one of the things though that I've found to be super important in my, the career path that I've navigated is always to root in personal values. I've found that throughout my career, many times I've had to make difficult choices and the best way to make those difficult choices is to think about what's important to me and really get precise on the values and therefore how I'm making choices to go to what role. Um, things that are important to me personally, just a little bit about me. Um, empathy is a word that we talk a lot about at Microsoft. Um, empathy and action is actually a phrase that we use. How are we bringing empathy for our customers, empathy for our fellow colleagues um, into our work every day. Uh, and that's a word that actually has been um, become part of the fabric of our culture at Microsoft because of our current chief executive officer. The head of our company right now, his name is Satya Nadella. Um, he's a former coder and rose up the ranks at Microsoft, um, yet has just incredible personal values that have helped really chart the company forward. I also have a personal value of working in a highly collaborative environment. Um, I found that to be, that was one of the reasons why I chose Duke to pursue my uh, business degree because it had a reputation for a very basic team-based culture. And, and those are the kinds of things that are important to me because, and I knew that if I were making choices based on my personal values, then I'd ultimately flourish and be most successful and most happy in my environment. Curiosity is something that I see as an incredibly important throughout my entire career. Curiosity that was required to frankly, be a science major, <laughs> and then ultimately chart um, my way through all the different phases and stages of the journey. Courage is something we talk a lot about at Microsoft um, because bravery is kind of really essential to, and being courageous with all of our work, all of our intentions, we find that with courage, we'll try new things, but trying new things is kind of essential for success in today's highly dynamic and often changing environment. Um, so when folks come to me and say, I don't know, I'm kind of scared about what this might be. I say, listen, let's do it. Let's fail fast and let's fail forward. We're only gonna learn by doing and we're only gonna gain by trying. Um, and fundamentally, uh, family and health are super important to me. And so every day I assure I plan my day, my week, my month. I have time set aside for not only my personal health, but of course, prioritizing time with my family. I find that that's super important to stay grounded. To get us started, um, I'd love to put, have everyone put kind of a word into the, in the chat window. Um, what is the first word that comes to mind for you when you think about Microsoft? Now, Microsoft is my current employer, and this is not a keynote about Microsoft, but just throw a word in there, any word. What, what's the first um, software is one? Trendsetter, Apple competitor, technology, Xbox. My kids think of Xbox first as well. <laughs> Azure, which is a key product of ours. Um, Bill Gates, someone thinks about Bill Gates. Yes, he's really become um, quite an icon, especially now with his focus on public health and where we are with our current pandemic situation. Seattle, um, Microsoft has an incredible presence in Seattle, but we actually also have really big um, development practices in Georgia and in Boston as well. So thanks for sharing some of your reflections. I thought to get us going next, I would share a quick video about actually uh, what it's like to work at Microsoft. So here we go. What's going on guys? We're having a good time. <laughs> The culture has changed so much. Everybody can grow and learn and develop. Yeah. 
when we make products for the world, we have to have perspective to the world. We get a lot of benefit by having a lot of diverse ideas in the room. We all bring something different to the table and that's, that's our strength. Basically, you end up having a team of highly collaborative friends that work together. That's why you have a tribe. That's why you have a community. And that's just how we make the world a better place. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. That's why Microsoft. So just a quick little snip around um, what my work environment is like every day. Um, you know, what some of the things that they sh shared in that video, anything, I'd love to see anything popped into the chat. Like, what did you guys see? Anything you noticed? Anything that stood out to you? Um, There's some folks that liked the video. Really anything that just sort of caught your eye. A lot of collaboration going on. Yeah, super friendly. They, um, it was very, a lot of sort of high energy bumping around. And um, some of that footage was taken in what we call consider our annual hackathon. It's called One Week. And every year, it's a week in July, in the middle of the summer, that every employee in the company, no matter what your role, um, if you're in sales, if you're in marketing, if you're in computing, if you're in operations, finance, you're encouraged and empowered to actually take the week off and hack for good or hack for purpose or hack for passion. And so there's usually um, nearly a thousand hacks that get built out for that week. You team up with people across the country, across the globe, all who may be passionate about your specific product. We've had um, teams create hackathons that have ultimately created new product capabilities that Microsoft has brought to market. Um, we have the Xbox Adaptive Controller, um, which you may have seen some videos for, is a, a, a controller that uh, now can be used with Xbox gaming, um, which doesn't require you know, very um, capable hands and fingers and thumbs. And there's immersive reader capabilities. There's some of our STEM workshops for kids were built in Hackathon. So just an example of um, the kinds of things that you can expect when you find a company that is a, has a culture that's aligned to your passion. So I encourage you all to uh, be courageous and try new things and think about how all of your experiences ladder back into your own personal passions and interest areas. But we're here to talk a little bit about um, a STEM career and what's it, what it is like as not only a woman, but as a female, but also um, just sort of STEM at all. And when man, when many people hear the term computer science, although potentially not, not you all, but you know, they often think that, that of technology or the technology that it actually creates. And ultimately, they don't realize that the beauty of computer science is actually not just the technology itself or the outcome, but in many cases, it's actually the process the process to create that technology. And so the reality is, is that computer science is actually a lot more about logic and problem solving and creativity. We'll talk a lot about creativity today and hopefully you saw some creativity in that video. Um, ultimately, the application of computer science teaches folks how to think differently and how to solve problems in context. So there's, um, logic that ultimately you learn that you'll be taking with you into any chapter of your life or your career or your, your ambitions. Um, ultimately, we think that computer science thinks, teaches folks how to create as, a, as opposed to how to consume. And it's super important to recognize that technology isn't just maybe HTML design or, but it can be the creation of an entire game that can be designed towards for women and the everything about um, game design in that case is rooted in the principles of logic problem solving and creativity of computer science. 
And so I'm sure many of you have heard some of the statistics that right now 65% of you will be doing jobs at some point in your career that currently don't exist today. The rate of change is actually just tremendously accelerating. And so, and 50% at this moment, right now, today, 50% of the jobs out there require some degree of technology skills, some degree. Um, but in 10 years, that's gonna be over 75%. And so think about how the evolution of this technical world is gonna evolve, some call it the fourth wave. We're in this, another revolution of the fourth, fourth wave where this idea between the digital and the physical are kind of blurring. And we don't even think anymore about kind of conversations that differ between our phone conversations and our personal conversations. It's almost hard to, the, the lines blur. And so, you know, it's incredible that to think that, you know, within just 10 years, over three quarters of the roles that all the jobs out there are going to require some form of these technical skills. So the opportunity is gain depth of experience in that and figure out a way to use your interest or the fun or what, what motivates you in, in STEM and turn it into your passions. Another way to look at this, so this is just sort of another way to sort of slice the numbers, is to look at the number of jobs that are called STEM. And now 71% of all STEM jobs are in computer science in some way, right? You don't, it doesn't have to be in computer science, but in some way, but yet only 8% of students in STEM ultimately study computer science. And so what that means is there's an incredible gap. There's an incredible need, incredible opportunity to take an interest or an appetite or a capability or strength in, in computer science and be able to go create jobs, create new industries, create new roles, um, and be a part of that team that is trying to figure out what jobs are going to exist tomorrow. So, I mean, STEM, job, STEM jobs overall are going twice as fast as the growth of every other job. I mean, the numbers are just sort of staggering when you think about it. Right now, the U.S. is shy, we're short, 450,000 professionals in software development skills at this moment, right? Just today, the whole, our country needs nearly half a million more folks in STEM to fill the jobs that are out there. So I'd propose that, it's hard to read this question, but the question isn't what do you want to do when you grow up, right? Because who knows what's next? Who knows how things change? You know, we, we have to think about how quickly things are changing, how new all of our the decisions are and say, well, it's not necessarily what do I wanna do when I grow up, but actually, what do I wanna to learn today? Because what I learned today and what I try today and what I succeed at today and what I fail at today are going to fold into experiences that I'll be able to carry with me for life and um, tell stories about, probably. At some point, you'll be like me telling some stories. And so this story that I have <laughs> to share with you all uh, of um, some of my earliest, very earliest career choices um, has to do with, yes, a, a burning grill. <laughs> so, um, one of my first jobs, it was a summer job that I had where I was, um, actually my dad owned his own small company and I ran a small, very small catering company. He was an auctioneer and so I'd go around to all of his auctions and I'd cater the auction. So I'd bake brownies the night before and I'd you know, get hot chocolate and I'd make coffee and I'd have, bake some muffins and go to the grocery store and buy lots of sodas and waters and all that kind of thing. And I served hot dogs. And <laughs> there was one day that um, I ended up, well, probably just not managing all of my priorities that well. And the hot dog cooker that I had um, 
caught fire. The whole thing basically looked like this. All the hot dogs that I had completely burned up. I didn't have any hot dogs left to serve these people. They were all singed in black and the whole thing was a total disaster. And so <laughs> ever since that time, a lot of the people that worked at um, the auction company, they, they changed the name of my little small catering job to, um, they called it Lydia's Fire Dogs. That was the, the new name of my company. And so, but you know what, I'll tell you, I learned so much in that job. And while I failed, you know, I, I failed forward. I ended up using all the money um, that I made to buy my own first car when I turned, uh, when I got my license and was eligible to. Um, I kept the name Lydia's Fire Dogs because it's kind of catchy. And then I ended up buying a steamer where I was steaming the hot dogs instead. Um, you know, and it was, it was a great experience and I had a lot of fun. And so the thing to think about is not only what do, not what do, what do I want to be when I grow up, is what do I want to learn today? But the second question to ask yourself is what do you enjoy? What really brings you satisfaction? Where are you your happiest? So I'll tell a second story about me. Um, and this talks to the whole idea of enjoyment. When I was in college, I told you all I went to Trinity and I chose Trinity because it had a great reputation in math and science. And, um, and I wanted to pursue a science degree. Well, when I arrived on campus and um, had a great freshman first year, met a lot of friends through some sports and my dorms and all those kinds of things, I was not finding any friends of mine that were in my science classes. Um, a lot of my friends were taking art history classes or history or sociology. And, you know, I just get kind of frustrated <clears throat> and, and sort of dejected. And I'll tell you what, I really ended up my sophomore year not doing so well in organic chemistry. Um, and I'll tell you what, it was one professor. It was one person that noticed. And he pulled me aside and he said, Lydia, you know, what's going on? You, clearly, you know, your freshman, you, you like science. What's, what's going on? Why are, you, why are things not going so well for you with organic chemistry? And I said, I don't know, Dr. De Phillips. I just, none of my friends are doing this. I think I'm just going to go be an econ major, okay? Like, I'm, I'm ready to check out and this, this is not going so well for me. And he said, well, what are you liking? What is interesting you know, interesting to you? I said, well, you know, a lot of my friends are taking art history. That sounds really interesting. I love art. It's always been, it's, it's, it's a pretty neat thing. And um, I also think I like economics. You know, I'm not sure. And that professor said, well, how about this? You're telling me you like art history. I said, yeah. He said, what if we were able to get you to try some research? And let's do some chemistry and scientific research on art. Would that be of interest? I was like, wow, that sounds really interesting. I had no idea. I thought I would just have to go like work in a lab with test tubes and beakers. This professor, he helped really change a little bit of a course in my life. We went to the Wadsworth Athenaeum. We actually did x-ray chromatography on the oil pigments to help date art. And um, I was able to work at the museum, the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford for an, an entire semester and wrote some, wrote some work that actually got published. And that changed everything for me. The fact that I could think about how I could take a STEM degree and pursue something that I saw that could be full of life and full of creativity and full of connections with people that I was um, developing common interests in with. So what I learned, I was grateful for that one teacher and I learned that, and I was reminded, <laughs> STEM is a platform for you to make lots of awesome career choices. So um, I've got a video up next that shares another opportunity about a career journey for a woman who's got a grounding in STEM. Here we go. It is a dream job. 
I run everything 343, so head of 343 Industries, which manages all things Halo. Not just the game, so we do all the books, action figures, toys, skateboards, shoes. We get to play in all aspects of the universe. This is the gunman. Unfortunately, the suit does not light up. He basically takes Nerf guns and he makes them look amazing. Some children don't grow up <laughs> and they get really awesome jobs. It's seriously like playing in the most amazing sandbox ever. Are you guys in there? In the concept cove, super secret stuff's going on. It is magical. You don't really have to work, this is work. Believe in your passion, be willing to make mistakes and um, have fun. But if you're passionate about your art, your craft, if you're passionate about sci-fi, you're passionate about storytelling, you're passionate about game design, you're passionate about development, um, this is a place where we're definitely going to push the limits. Oh. We probably need to go. Do you want to? So uh, before we get started, this is Kiki's 15-year anniversary here. What I would say to other women is entertainment's for everyone and we want your opinions. I think that the more diverse team you have, the more interesting creative process that you get. Now come on! Go. Dang! I'm Bonnie Ross and I run 343 Industries for Microsoft Studios. I love you. <laughs> That's perfect. That was great. That was awesome. So what did you notice in that video? Anything that caught your eye, anything, any, just go ahead and pop it into the chat. Um, well, what were your reflections for having seen that? Yeah, fun and creative. <laughs> Work is a lot of fun. Yeah, Bonnie Ross, I think she really, truly does love her job. I think it totally brings her joy. Um, and that's just it. You really can turn your passions, and in this case for her, it's gaming, you know, into your career. Um, I talked to some women who love fashion, just love it. Well, you know, game design requires a lot of fashion. Talked to some women who um, absolutely love, um, you know, sort of following stock markets. Well, there's a ton of opportunity with all of the data science that's required um, and to follow and be, have a successful career in finance these days. There's so um, much awesome opportunity out there with, with careers. And, you know, a STEM career can take you on a lot of different journeys. So you just have to ask yourself, you know, what's next? What do I do, what do, I want to do next? What do I want to learn today? And how can I connect my curiosity and my passions? Um, you know, Bonnie said two things. She said, follow your passions and make mistakes. And it's super important to do both because both those experiences allow, feed into each other and allow us to be, um, to learn from our mistakes, to grow from our mistakes uh, and know, and frankly, the journey will help us sharpen what our passions are. Sometimes we don't know, um, but, but you'll learn, you know, while you're in there. So certainly the number one source of new wages is computing. I mean, it's incredible to see the source of new wages, and this is a co according to code.org, um, that are associated with the computing. It's the number one source of new wages across the country and across the globe. Um, you know, it, it, at Microsoft, we talk a lot about these STEM roles. We don't necessarily think, Everyone who's pursuing STEM is going to become an artificial intelligence engineer or a NASA engineer, but because but these groundings in computer science and in STEM provide such a platform for opportunity. And then we talk about wages. You know, if the number one source of wages is computing, how do the salaries stack up? Well, you know, the lifetime earnings of a high school graduate, they're saying is, you know, 0.58 million. And from the Brookings Institute, that a value of a computer science education is incredibly high. And in fact, a college graduate is 1.19 million. But the lifetime earnings of a computer science major 
is nearly another 50% of that, 1.67 million. So even no matter what career path you wanna choose, just having the computer science major in your, under your belt provides an opportunity to open doors. Now, um, when we looked at all the registration links for today's event, we saw a lot of folks from Massachusetts and we, we think we saw folks from Georgia. Now, I know that there are folks from all over. We saw California, we saw Texas coming in from the chat, which was great. But so in advance, I just did, I researched two things really quickly. And I looked at, in computer science, first of all, I narrowed it down to Florida and Georgia. And first I looked at the number of computer science jobs that are open as of this moment in the state. Then I looked at the number of computer science graduates each year in that state. And I'm really ready for you guys to um, put your vote in here. Okay, so in Massachusetts, the number of open computer science jobs that are out there is 13,000 at the moment, 13,000 jobs. This moment, I got this data literally last week. How many students each year do you think graduate with a computer science degree to fill that 13,000 number? Go ahead and type, type your number into the chat. Take a wild guess. How in the whole state of Massachusetts across all the institutions, you know, from MIT, for wherever, to um, state colleges, to community colleges. Yep, we, I see 10,000, I see 5,000, 6,000, 1,500, 7,000, 10,000, yep. Well, you guys are smart to say, figure out that it's less than 13. <laughs> That's right, 2,900. So the person who actually put 2,000 in is, I think, potentially one of the closest. Well, actually, 2757. <laughs> it looks like someone maybe went to code.org. You can go to code.org slash promote, and you can look up your state. You can look up any state in the country, and the date. it's always real-time data. I mean, think about this. CS graduates, 2,900 a year. And we're filling a small fraction of what's required of just the open jobs. Never mind the jobs that are going to be created. Never mind the, the jobs that are going to evolve. Okay, let's get on to Georgia. What do you, all right? Somewhat similar numbers, 13,400. Maybe it's different. Anyone want to guess Georgia? Well, yeah, exactly. Right. Yes, 2,700. So it's low. If, if hopefully if you, take away nothing else today. It's just play the numbers. <laughs> Give it a whirl and figure out how you can connect your passions to STEM. Microsoft invests a lot in this and we're committed to an environment where we have a diverse and inclusive workplace and where we support people's passions. And we do our, we, we work on um, scaling across all kinds of um, diverse backgrounds and we're committed to diversity in our company because we know that if we're gonna build products um, that serve the world, we need to have teams of talent that make up the world. And so it's very important for us to recruit women, men, all ethnicities, all walks, all experiences, just, and so one of the things in particular that's very new is there's a whole, um, we do Hour of Code every year for the younger kids, which we create Minecraft coding games um, as part of Hour of Code for code.org. Well, we've actually created some Wonder Woman um, tech skill capabilities with code hunts and learn to code lessons. So if you were potentially maybe someone you know might be interested in this, it's a fun thing to share. Um, maybe there, are, I think this is probably for a little bit younger crew, but those that are interested in sort of figuring out what, did, what is coding like to be able to see a female supermodel um, have a sort of the basis and framework for some coding lessons is that I think is pretty fun and cool. So I encourage folks to, to check it out. So a STEM career can take you 
lots and lots of places. Um, I feel fortunate enough to be working in the education team at Microsoft, so I'm able to get into the classroom and help kids build robotic fingers and see data visualization in Excel and learn about um, wind tunnels and understand circuits and lots of fun stuff. Um, but I'm also able to you know, have my STEM career and the foundation that it's built take me to things like keynoting the National Spelling Bee and um, speaking to folks like yourself um, around the importance of a STEM career. So this is, um, been, you know, it's no, it's super fun for me to be a part of today's journey and conversation. Um, and, but it's just one of the great examples of things that we can do with our STEM degrees. And in fact, you know, there, there's just limitless opportunities when we think about even in STEM, you can imagine like, see some examples here. You can be a jeweler, you know, and learn about the science of metals. You can be a kennel manager and, and learn about the science of animals, um, the science of uh, all of being a landscape architect is, is an incredible opportunity. And, and there's so many doors open when we pursue um, careers in STEM. And I'll get back to the, my comment from earlier where I said at very first, um, I didn't see a lot of my friends in STEM. And while that was true my first year, but also what ended up happening in college is by my fourth year, I had really deep lasting friendships with my fellow women. We were outnumbered. We were about 20% of the um, fellow chemistry majors at Trinity in my year. Um, but the, we, and we made great friends with all the guys there and we, we really stuck together, made it through all the labs and ultimately did lots of different things. I had friends that went to Wall Street and, and worked in the derivatives desk. I had friends that went to Biogenetic and worked in um, Biogen and, and, you know, someone like myself went into pharmaceutical sales. So great example of just all the opportunities for for career exploration when you have a foundation in STEM. So as we wrap up, I'll show one last video that I thought might um, provide a little bit of motivation. It's about a minute. One inventor is Benjamin Franklin. Leonardo da Vinci. Thomas Edison. Alexander Bell Graham. Hmm. No. Kind of a tough one. Hmm. Um, in school, it was always a male inventor. I just realized. that there were women before me. It gives me like motivation that I can invent something and make maybe like a change in the world and that would be really cool. <laughs> so as we wrap up, um, just like that video asks you, what are you gonna make? Um, Ask yourself that question. What are you going to learn today? You know, what are you going to make today? Because if we do what we love, we get the opportunity to map our own future. It's incredible to realize that Ada Lovelace actually built the first computer algorithm in the 1800s before computers actually existed. And I want to be hearing about what you all invent and what you all make um, in the days, years to come. So thank you so much. I encourage you, I empower you to pursue your passion. Let your passion allow you to bring your authentic self to everything that you do. And then therefore, you guys are gonna be the ones creating these new jobs and you all are gonna be the ones impacting the world. So thank you so much for your time today. We, we may have a few more minutes. I'm happy to try to answer um, a few questions if that's of interest to anyone. Um, but it's been great um, for the conversation and thanks for all the chats. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Lydia. It was very inspirational and eye-opening. So yeah, we can definitely open up like a short five minute um, Q&A session if anyone has questions. So it looks like someone saying, um, what are the ways that high schoolers can explore careers in STEM? And I would um, offer to you that, that you could, I would say that the web is your friend, you know, and there are lots of opportunities for you to explore um, STEM projects, STEM internships. In fact, because of our current pandemic, we're finding companies to be very creative in internships and in providing new opportunities. Um, I know, for example, um, Fidelity is looking at interns who are, and providing, you know, because people can just work from wherever at the, at the moment. Um, and there are internships to apply for and internships to experience. I would encourage you to check out code.org um, I, they have resources for various ages and grades around things to sort of explore and just try. Um, but think of it as just N plus one, right? Just what are you looking at? What do you like? Follow your passions and the internships, the experiences will come to you. Um, happy to reach out and connect with anyone. Um, my LinkedIn is probably a great way to, to connect with me. It's Lydia Smyers, S-M-Y-E-R-S. -E also, my Twitter is at Lydia Smyers. Um, and I think that that's a great, um, great way to, great um, way to connect with me. There's a question here that says, you know, how is working at Microsoft different than working at the other companies? And I'd say that it is different. Um, I would say that every company, you know, it's a lot like every family, you know, everyone kind of has it, their own culture and you will want to find a company that matches your personal passions and your personal priorities. Um, I was, I've been fortunate to have some great experiences and absolutely every company that I've worked in. Um, but there were very different ones. Um, I'd say that Oracle was a, a, a big company that acted like a small one. They gave, you know, they were allowed you to be really creative and um, kind of entrepreneurial, but they were a company that focused very much on its um, customers, which is super good and super important but maybe less so on its employees. And I'd say at Microsoft, there's a real attention to the Microsoft culture and creating an environment where people can really do their best work. And ultimately that allows us to live our mission, our mission of empowering every person and every organization on the whole planet to achieve more. Because we believe at Microsoft that when technology is within reach, we believe human potential is amplified. And so, this is an incredible um, opportunity. So there's a question. Um, the, did you take any STEM coding related courses in high school? Um, <laughs> it's a good question. So I, there, were, there was Pascal <laughs> taught, um, but I actually did not. I did not take that one course. I did take coding classes in college when I got to college. Um, and so I think about how much the world has changed and I think several things. I think first of all, for those of you that are having these experiences and the ability to do coding in high school, it's awesome and so great. I didn't necessarily have those opportunities myself, but I also think that it's never too late. You know, it's never too late to try anything and to always try new things um, enables you to sort of broaden your experiences and um, your capabilities. So um, I one question here, I heard Microsoft has many positions open for women, but it's hard to find the right women to fill these positions. Why is that? Um, Microsoft is very committed to recruiting um, great talent, because we know that we're only as good as our people. 
and Microsoft is also very committed to having our employees really represent our world. So we look for people who are diverse, have different, different experiences. We look for people who may have disabilities. We look for people who, um, to, who, have, who think in different ways. We have a whole autism hiring program actually, um, as one example. We have an, um, a disability hiring program. All of these are because we see that the more diverse our company is, the better able we are able to meet the needs of this diverse world. And so um, I think Microsoft often <laughs> seeks women because we know uh, that there are, you know, women make up 50% of um, the globe <laughs> and we need some great women thinkers, great women leaders to be able to be empathetic to all of our customers' needs and to be able to design products that are going to really help amplify potential in people. So um, Microsoft Seattle has a high school internship. Does Massachusetts also? Yes, we do. We have a location in Massachusetts called the Garage. Um, and there's probably a uh, form on there for internships. We've done some high school internships and I would encourage folks to look into it. We also have Imagine Cup, which is our annual competition, um, which is a pretty cool thing. Um, Imagine Cup and Imagine Cup Junior are um, our national and global competitions with teams that create new products by harnessing the power of our capabilities and our technology. Um, I've been a judge at the Imagine Cup finals and I've observed and seen all the incredible projects. Um, folks have built like cap new capabilities in our HoloLenses. They've built incredible sensor technology powered by Azure to do things like uh, make farming more intelligent. It's, it's a, so I would encourage you to look up Imagine Cup as well. Um, I'm not sure if there's internship opportunities in Georgia yet. Our presence there is growing, but I would encourage you to look um, on job boards, not just only on LinkedIn, because there's lots of job and internship postings on LinkedIn. Please do pursue those. But also when you go to the career pages, um, I think with COVID now, there's lots of opportunities to do internships remotely and people are looking for folks with great ideas and great talent. So we're at the top of the hour and I thought I'd pause there um, to reflect back to our leaders. I just wanna say to Yoon and Anna and Saruthi, thank you so much for your leadership, what you've done to put on this incredible event. Um, I know this is taking like nights and weekends and time out of school, um, but what an incredible community you've built. So just thank you so much for all that you've done. Thank you so much. We really loved having you here today. And just oh. respectful of everyone's time, I think we can wrap up to, for today. But um, I think Anna will paste in the website and our email address and also our Instagram right now. So we post all our updates on our Instagram. So if you do want to come to more keynote events in the future, definitely hit us a follow. And if you have questions, um, whether it be about our program or to Lydia, definitely message her or message us. You know, we're always here to answer your questions. So thank you all so much for coming. I had a great time personally. I learned so much from you, Lydia. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> I learned a ton from you guys. Thank you for all that you're doing. It's I tell you, I wish I had some of these experiences when I was in high school. Um, and so it's great that people are gonna be able to follow their passions um, with opportunities like Metro Hacks and Empower Her. Thanks everybody, have a great day. Bye everyone. Thank you everyone. Have a wonderful day.